Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences. On the second Wednesday of each month, and sometimes in between, we discuss the latest bioscience publications. And as a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. For today's special episode, I was joined by Richard Pelican, who's a bioinformatician at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, and also by Austin Schwinn, who's a data scientist at Exaptive, a software startup that's also a new AIBS member. They joined me to talk about epigenetics, chromatin looping, and a collaboration leading to a new tool that lets disease researchers view those loops in three dimensions. And if that all sounds a little bit confusing or overwhelming to you, uh, don't worry, because it did to me too. Before I talk to our guests, I'll let them explain everything. Let's go to the interview. So Richard and Austin, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, great to be here. Okay, so before we get into the nitty gritty of this collaboration and what it enables, I was hoping, Richard, you could give us just a little bit of background about um, epigenetics more generally and just sort of, you know, give our listeners a a baseline understanding that'll, you know, serve them well as we talk in more depth about chromatin looping and, you know, 3D modeling thereof. Okay, so classical genetic studies have shown that there are many places in the genome that don't seem to be related to protein coding regions uh, that are associated with disease, but are in what was thought to be so-called junk DNA or non-protein coding regions. Uh, Turns out that these non-protein coding regions are actually very regulatory and they have uh, complex roles in how they modify uh, gene expression. So the field of epigenetics aims to uh, unravel how these regulatory regions that look like they're not really associated with any protein coding genes uh, may affect Uh, downstream gene expression uh, through changes in the genetics. So it's like another layer of molecular mechanism control on top of how your genetics is structured. And one of the, one of the uh, epigenetic mechanisms we're studying in particular is how your DNA folds compactly to fit in a cell. If your DNA is linearized and spread out in a line, it would be just as long as your arm is outstretched, but somehow it has to coil and compact itself to fit neatly within a cell. And this folding and unfolding is uh, epigenetically controlled, and it may play a role in how uh, genetic mutations may influence your risk for developing a disease. Okay, and I want to reflect that back to you just for a second to make sure that I've got it right. So the protein coding regions of the DNA are what we would think about when we think very traditionally about genetics. You know, it's coding for a trait or something along those lines. And then the non-protein coding regions that were previously thought to be junk DNA have an influence on those protein coding regions in some way? Yeah, they're like modulating effects. Okay, so you know, what, what, what types of effects are those? Um, they could be activation or repression. So you have methylation, which typically can repress uh, a regulatory element, or you have acetylation, which uh, chemically activates a region. So these are a couple examples. Okay, and we often find these, you say, um, you know, in the way that the DNA is folded up so that it fits into a cell. Right. So say you want to activate a gene, there may be regulatory enhancers that are around it, that if they're acetylated, uh, they may fold together in a certain way so that the gene is more accessible to other molecular mechanisms within the cell. Okay, so the DNA is the code, and then uh, the epigenetics would be sort of uh, the code that tells the code how to run and which parts to run? Exactly. So tell us a little bit more now about you know, the folding and how this fits into the cell. I, I understand that you know that DNA, if you stretch it all out, would be very long, and it needs to be crammed into the cell in one way or another. But how does that folding come into play, and how does that relate to the epigenetic features? Well, genes that you're not really interested in using can, can be safely stored in your attic, right? You don't really need to bring it out. Like my Christmas lights... For most of the year, they stay coiled up in a box somewhere just to save room. It's the same way with your genes. So if if a certain cell type doesn't need a gene, it can can stay coiled up and compressed in an area uh, until it's needed. Whereas other genes, which may be more important, um, there needs to be efficient ways to uncoil the DNA, make the gene accessible to the rest of the cell, and when it's all done, you know, coil it back up and compact it so that the cell can go on and do other things. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, and now what I'm curious about is, you know, how do we look at that and examine that, you know, in a real world sense? It's way too small for us to look at with anything like a microscope. You know, right. how, do we, how do we know this? How do we understand it? How do we think about it? 
Uh, a lot of the ways that we work on this in our lab is uh, we do high throughput gen genomic testing where you can think of it, that we isolate the DNA from cells, either from healthy or diseased patients, and we do unbiased genome-wide assays that target specific molecular interactions, like only give us sections of the DNA that are touching each other in loops. And we can isolate those DNA fragments, sequence them, figure out where they are in the genome, and then analyze whether or not there are differences between healthy people and uh, patients. Okay, so I think that gives us a good overview of, you know, kind of the system and how it works. But in applying this, how would this come into play if we were to talk about, say, a disease? Right. So our laboratory is focused on studying autoimmune diseases, in particular lupus. And lupus is a really hard disease to diagnose. Um, it's got many different symptoms, and it's incredibly complex. There's no silver bullet for what genetic areas uh, cause it or make you more risk prone to develop it. So our hypothesis is that by studying these regulatory regions around known uh, genomic loci for autoimmune disease risk factors uh, may uh, improve our understanding of how the disease works, how it develops, and how we might be able to ultimately uh, treat or cure uh, lupus. So there's no lupus gene, but you're thinking that these regulatory regions um, you know, may provide some insight if you're able to examine them carefully into what's causing the disease. Right. All right. So then moving to the loops, you know, how does understanding loops and that process help us understand autoimmune disease? Well, basically, uh, what we want to do is see where the loops are occurring in healthy people and do a very simple comparison to how looping structure is uh, explained in disease patients or people with lupus. And by understanding which regulatory regions are touching other important places in the genome in healthy people that might not be in lupus, uh, we'll be able to zoom in on uh, regulatory mechanisms that may be driving lupus risk. Okay. And, and how do you look at those loops? So the old way of visualizing the loops is just by drawing it, uh, DNA out as a line in two dimensions and drawing an arc from place to place that, that may be uh, connected in a loop. Okay, and, you know, and, and we'll make sure that we, uh, we make this accessible to the readers uh, or the listeners who are looking in the show notes. Um, but I'm, I'm looking at the, that, that original structure now. Uh, it looks pretty complicated, kind of like a spider web, and it would be hard to, um, it would be hard to understand you know, how all of those things link together um, just from looking at that image. Uh, is, is that tough for you folks too, or, or do you have the apparatus to, to figure it out and understand it without that? Well, no, it's difficult because I don't think anybody in our lab is really good at origami. And you can, you can sit there and try to fold the piece of paper uh, to try to understand how the gene that you're interested in may be interacting with regulatory regions. But um, some of these regulatory networks can be very complex, as you pointed out. It's like a spider web. Uh, and it doesn't really inform you about the, the three-dimensional shape, which I think is one of the more critical parts of this analysis because you're, you're working in a very compact environment. Um, molecules need to be able to access genes, and uh, yeah, understanding how the three-dimensional folding is, is actually resulting in different shapes is probably very important in this topic. Okay, and I think that now leads to a very natural and obvious transition, and a question for Austin, who's been very patient, which is, you know, how did Exaptive's role come into play here in creating a collaboratively developed tool to help researchers visualize these 3D structures? Uh, so I have a general idea of how the project uh, actually originated. I was actually brought on uh, after OMRF and Exaptive had agreed to a pilot project, uh, that's when I was actually hired on to Exaptive uh, to essentially help out with this project. Um, but it, at its origins, um, Exaptive had reached out to OMRF um, just to kind of find out, hey, what kind of problems are you running into? We're developing uh, our software platform right now. Can we use you guys as a test bed to just try out our software, get feedback from your organization, um, and really just go from there? So essentially, uh, the CEO of our company, I, I believe the, the president of OMRF, uh, identified three different labs with three different use cases that, um, that we could help try to tackle. And Richard's lab was one of those um, that, that we took on um, to, to try to build a tool around. Okay, cool. And, and now let's talk about the tool a little bit. Um, you know, 
what is it? What's what's this thing do? And I'm going to ask questions about how it works, um, and those may be easy to answer, and those may be impossible to answer. But describe a little bit the tool that that you created, and you know how it helps us look at these looping structures. Mm-hmm. So I'm actually to answer that, I'm going to take a, a bit of a step back, real quick, um, and just kind of talk about the philosophy of our company and how we try to tackle problems like this. So our company's name is Exaptive which is based around the, the term exaptation, which if you're not familiar with, uh, you've probably heard of adaptation, where uh, you change some type of function to, uh, to adapt or change to, to a new environment. An exaptation is an adaptation where that change isn't, uh, the outcome isn't what was originally meant for it to be. So a biological example of this is actually bird's feathers. Um, so feathers were hollow, uh, which trapped air, which actually helped uh, birds stay warm. But that hollow structure also made feathers very light. So as birds developed this hollow feather structure, say one fell out of a nest off a cliff, light kind of, let's call it a, a graceful fall with those light feathers. And eventually over time, this, this led to flight. Um, in, an example of this in human discovery is Gutenberg's printing press was actually uh, very closely based on uh, wine presses of the time. So essentially, this is taking an idea from one subject matter and trying to uh, exapt or adapt it to another. So when we first met with OMRF, uh, they showed us this 2D visualization, said they wanted a 3D visualization for it, but neither one of us really knew uh, what we wanted that to be or specifically what OMRF wanted that to be. Uh, So the first thing we tried to do was pull from existing visualizations that we knew uh, and figure out ways that we can maybe use this for this particular use case. So this visualization actually comes from uh, social networks and the way we visualize those. Uh, So it's what's called a force directed network uh, diagram, um, where essentially in a social setting, uh, each node would be a person. So if we imagine like Facebook or LinkedIn, you know, you have Austin and Richard, and then they're connected by a line or an edge. And that edge is our relationship, right? So Austin is a colleague of Richard, and that connects us to nodes. Uh, so what we try to do is take this visualization and represent it as a DNA sequence. So we have a, a long line, kind of like Richard was saying, those are all the edges. Then each of the nodes that make up that line that are connected are, uh, are those bonding points, those, those anchors for those, those loops, bonds. Um, and then... Essentially what the force directed diagram does is push all those nodes away from each other and we get a a straight line. And then what we do is uh, create another edge that pulls two nodes that are the anchors of a loop, pulls those together so that the the line in between those actually creates the loop structure around them. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. And, and you know, I think we'll share with the listeners um, an image of exactly what this looks like in in a real sense. But that's a that's a great story. So this is originally coming from technology um, that was used to describe social networks, and now it's being used to describe chromatin loops. Exactly, exactly. Um, and although in our first meeting we we kind of decided on, hey, we think uh, this force directed network diagram, we think that this could be the way to visualize it. Uh, But the actual implementation of it, you know, the first iteration was nowhere close to uh, really what, like, Rich's lab wanted. Well, um, you know, to be be fair, we had no idea what was going to come out because up until then, I mean, like I said, we're not good at origami. So we had no idea what the first three-dimensional representation is going to look like. And there's no uh, really simple tool that will you can put in a DNA sequence and it'll predict what the, what the folding is going to look like. Um, so yeah, the first iteration, maybe even the second or third, uh, didn't really turn out to be what we expected, but that's, that's the nature of science. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like Richard was saying, very iterative process of coming back with, with one version, Hey, between the last version, and this one, what's looking better what don't you like? What can we fix moving forward? And just coming back iteration after iteration, probably five or six times until we actually had uh, 
really a tool that was usable for them. Okay, and now why don't you tell me a little bit about you know, um, what this tool is like in action. And if you'd like to refer to the image that I'm looking at right now uh, and that our listeners will certainly have access to, please feel free. What's it like working with this sort of imagery, with this sort of representation versus looking at and working with uh, you know, the more traditional representations? Well, it's just easier to understand what parts of the gene are kind of being pulled together in a central hub Um, because that's probably where a lot of regulatory activity is happening. There are transcription factor complexes that kind of bind things together, and they may play key roles in uh, how that gene is is being used in a cell. Um, If a particular mutation is altering a regulatory region that affects how those regions are being pulled into a hub, uh, that may help us understand uh, the, the nature of the disease risk that it's influencing. Okay, and I guess, you know, I'm wondering now what's next for this research. Obviously, we don't yet have a cure on the immediate horizon for um, lupus or or many of these other disease states, but what's next for this research and what's next for this tool and how is it set to help us, um, you know, understand the role of chromatin looping in human disease states and so on? Well, I think clearly it's going to come down to how we can measure changes in the three-dimensional shape of these things. Um, in, in many autoimmune disease risk loci, we can now use this tool to uh, simulate the three-dimensional shapes with and without important genetic alterations and see what the major structural differences are in the three-dimensional space. Um, so that would be the first next step. Another possible next step would be um, in these loops, there are parts that are extruded far away from the central hubs what DNA binding motifs do they possess? Are they uniquely uh, more accessible than uh, other parts along the genome? And are these more accessible regions somehow related to autoimmune disease risk? Okay. And are there any next steps, um, you know, coming for the tool from the tool itself? You know, are, are we going to see new versions that are going to, um, you know, enable any of those types of things? Or, or is it already baked into the tool as it is? Um, well, so as far as, like, deployment of uh, the tool itself, so the next big step actually is, um, so we we essentially have a platform that we're going to be unrolling for all of ORMRF's organization. We do this with a lot of different organizations. But essentially, all the different scientists in ORMRF are going to be able to come onto our platform answer a series of onboarding questions about, you know, their su- like their expertise, what subject matters they're, uh, they're working in, what tools or technologies they normally use. And from that information, uh, from everyone in the organization, we're going to try to recommend other scientists that, hey, you may be working on a different problem, kind of just like the, you know, chromatin looping to social networks hey, are you working on a different problem that on the surface may seem like there isn't a large amount of overlap, but as we start to look into your, you know, the technologies you use or your expertise, once we start looking into that, is there some kind of overlap that we can recommend? Hey, check out this tool. Either use it with, maybe you have the same type of data. Maybe you can use the exact same tool. Or is there a further iteration that we can take this same tool or, you know, a branch of it, some some other iteration of it to solve a problem that you are facing then. So try to use the same tool and do that same acceptation process within the organization itself. Right. And who knows, maybe there's someone outside the organization who has a lot of expertise in social network analysis, and they may not care too much about three-dimensional chromatin structure, but they may help us uh, be able to understand why differences in our so-called social networks of chromatin uh, may be uh, relevant markers for disease progression, for example. It sounds like there's a there's an abundance of opportunity out there and a lot more to come from this story. Um, and we're going to look forward to hearing more about it. So thank you both very much for joining me today. It's our pleasure. Yeah, absolutely. And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. But before we go, I'd like to encourage everyone to head on over to Exaptive.com and read about this and some of their other projects. You know, it's a fascinating company, and we really only scratched the very top surface layer in this episode. So there's a lot more cool stuff to read about. Thank you, and talk to you next time.